I know all of you know not only about the good things, but the terrible things that are happening in the world. If you watch television news or read the newspapers, you know about the millions of people actually displaced in Africa that are being murdered, tortured, raped, humiliated all over that continent. Not a few, but hundreds of thousands. And actually, as far as being humiliated and run out of their homes, millions of them. And others in Asia and the Middle East, or of course, as we read about the daily horrible things happening uh, to even to our young men, the two young men that got captured, you know, they were apparently tortured and then dragged behind cars through the streets and then their heads were chopped off. That's the reward we had for going in to help their nation. But those things are happening all over the world right now. We're going to have a terrible problem there. And I predicted that we will not have democracy in the Middle East. That's not God's way, and it's not going to work anyway, especially there. That's contrary to everything they've ever been taught or known or want. That particular type of Gentile individual is looking for a strong man to take charge, and that's what they will eventually have, humanly, until Christ comes. And he will be the really strong man that they need, and have the strength as well as wisdom and mercy at the same time. We know about North Korea right now testing a missile or getting ready to apparently that could reach the United States. We know about the other problems, of course, including uh, the avian flu that is scheduled to come here from all indications. And as I said, I think a week or so ago, uh, Oprah Winfrey had this special and it's really scary seeing it, this top side is showing it is going to come. It's not a matter of whether, but when. And he's predicting 240 to 360 million people may be wiped out by that. We do need God's help in the days ahead. We are going to have problems. And one of the most important tools we're going to need to understand, to really understand and to use, is the tool of prayer. And I want to speak on that. I've not spoken on that for quite a long time. I'm going to co concentrate today on a special aspect of it rather than just all the basics as we normally do, I want to speak on breakthrough prayer. Many brethren over the years have asked me, including in recent years, how can I really get my prayers answered? Do you know of any keys? Do you know of any special help? And I want to give you some keys this afternoon that I'll talk about regarding breakthrough prayers, where you can really break through the barriers between you and God and get your prayers answered. Uh, Remember the basics, first of all, and I'll cover a couple of those. I won't try to cover them all, but I'm not going to turn to all these scriptures. But first, we must obey God. We know that, and I'll just give you one scripture on that, an old favorite, I hope, of all of us. 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments, plural. That's what God says. The antecedent is not Christ, it's God. God's commandments, not some new commandments of Jesus. Of course, Jesus' new commandments were simply magnifying God's commandments. We understand that, but often the world does not. So for the sake of argument, he's talking about God the Father. So we, whatever we ask when we pray, we get answers because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And there are quite a number of things that are pleasing in God's sight. As you know, a whole way of life. And we ought to try to do that as perfectly as we can. And if we do, we'll more likely have our prayers answered. Also, we all know the basic scriptures, so many of them about faith. That's another very basic precondition to answered prayer. And back in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, God tells us, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Notice that word diligently. Most people in the world half-heartedly seek God. They do not diligently seek God, but he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. And God will give that faith if we diligently seek him. And, of course, that's so important, and to be diligent in whatever we do. Many other factors enter into prayer, obviously. You need to pray in a private place. Jesus says, go in your own room to a private place. He does not discourage public prayer, but our main prayer should not be in public, as the world often does, but overwhelmingly in private, where we go into our 
our bedroom or bathroom or some private room we can find in our home. And I've told you in the past how on the baptizing tours we would often take turns. One of us would pray in the room and the other would pray in the bathroom, even though the bathroom in those little old motels, uh, cozy courts or whatever they were called back in the 1950s weren't very nice. We had to chase the cockroaches away, but we prayed anyway. We were more important. Our prayer life was more important than the cockroaches. And many times I've had to just kind of not worry about them over there and just pray about God and find various places to pray. You can find a private place to pray if you look for one. Don't think you can't. I'm sure you can. So find a private place to pray and be sure you do learn to pray on your knees. I've given you those scriptures in my booklet and articles and sermons for the last 56 years, or 50, 53 years, excuse me. I've certainly preached on that. Where the Bible shows you get on both knees to God, you pray, bow one knee to a king. Don't bow both knees to a king, both knees to God. And when you find it described in the Bible, you'll so often find a Solomon in his dedicatory prayer for the temple and other prayers, the men of God would kneel on both knees and as we read even in the New Testament, uh, Paul said, I desire that everywhere men lift up hands, holy hands, without wrath and doubting. Now, you don't have to pray that way for a full hour. If you pray for a full hour, which you should once in a while, frankly, you'll get tired. Your back will get tired and your shoulders will get tired holding your hands up so you can kind of move around and, you know, or get yourself a brace, you know, where you have a prayer uh, sort of a prayer stool or prayer something you lean on. And God understands that. But basically, that's the best way to pray. I like to find a place where I look out the window and I'm looking up to God. We had a place in my study in uh, San Diego where I could do that. And here in our home, why I have uh, my wife's computer room. I've, ta I've taken over early in the morning because we have a window that faces out. And I'm looking at the trees and the creation look rather than looking at a wall. And I can see the sun coming through the trees and so on. It's much more inspiring to pray that way than looking at a wall. That's just a suggestion if you can find something like that where you're talking to the Creator. You're looking up and there's a creation of God Almighty, the great God of the universe. So think about that as you pray, just, just basic things. But now I want to give you four breakthrough keys. I could give you a lot more, but I want to have time to cover those that I am giving today. First of all, the first key I'd like to give you to help you break through to God is something very basic here. All of them are basic, but we don't think about them and dwell on them as perhaps as much as we should. Make prayer a habit and persevere in that habit and in your prayers. Brethren, many, many books have been written and I know Dr. Scott Winnell has studied all kinds of management books and referred to them and his father as well. And I have read books like that over the years as well of success and leadership and accomplishment. And they all tell you how important it is to develop right habits. And if you can understand the vital importance, vital, I mean absolutely vital to your eternal life, you brethren here and your brethren around the world, understand that. Of getting the habit, building the habit of regular prayer, where it's just like breathing out and breathing in. Because if I find if I don't keep regularly going to the YMCA, for instance, to help me with any problems that I may have, then I, you know, they just, you, pretty soon you start skipping once or twice, then you start skipping more. And the same thing with prayer. But try to build a habit. And many of us have done that through the years, not bragging. We should have done by now. We're just like breathing out and breathing in. I don't want to get up and I don't want to eat breakfast until I prayed. And I think it'd be better to miss breakfast than to not pray. What do you think? You better start thinking that way. Prayer is a lot more important than even your physical food in many instances. You've got to build the habit of prayer. And one of the best things to do is to build the habit God says, seek first the kingdom of God. Don't put God's ways and what you do for him last, where you wait just before you go to bed at night. Now, that's what I was taught, and not my parents were all sincere, and that's fine for a little child. Just before I would go to bed or as I was laying in bed, when well, my dad or mother would come and kneel by the bed, and we'd say, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and we'd say the little bedtime, Protestant bedtime prayer. Later, as I got older, I recognized that I needed to pray apart from that, so I would pray earlier before I'd go to bed, but still in the evening. 
When I came to Ambassador College, I was, my first roommate was Herman Hay, who was later the first man ordained into the ministry after Mr. Armstrong, the full-time ministry. And I would get up about 6.30 or 7 in the morning, but Herman had been up from 5.30 or 6 because he grew up on a farm, and he would just wake up early, which I hadn't learned to do, and he was gone. I thought, where's Herman? And I went down, and he wasn't in the bathroom, and he wasn't here, and he wasn't there. And finally I asked him, he said, well, you know, I said, I'm praying. I said, most of us, well, and I went down, and I tried to find Raymond and Marion McNair, and they had disappeared. And Ken Herman and Raymond Cole and all the guys, they were gone. This is a spooky place. I thought, everybody's gone. <laughs> Where are they? I began to realize that a couple of them had a prayer room back under the attic. Some had a prayer room in the basement. Some had prayer rooms stuck here and there around Mayfair, the student dorm at that time. I found my prayer room at the bottom of the stairs in the, in the basement in the broom closet. And it was this concrete floor. So I had the habit of bringing down some newspapers, or maybe they left them there. I had a system where I was somehow needed, not just on the floor, but I was trying to pray in the broom closet. Well, I couldn't look outside and see the sun in that prayer room, but that's where I started praying. At least everybody else had their place already, already taken. But in the morning, no one interfered. Oh, I'm too busy. This has happened. Dr. Monell's sermonette pictures it fully. You get involved. Someone grabs you. The phone rings. Oh, you got to do this. And pretty soon the day is gone and you haven't prayed till lunch. And you begin to feel guilty. You think, what's going on? It's already afternoon and I haven't even been on my knees before the great God of the universe. What's wrong? So then you try desperately to pray in the afternoon and sometimes your time is taken up and you can't pray as you should as much or as heartfeltly or as long and then night comes and then you finally do when you're tired. Don't do that. Don't do that. The best examples in the Bible of God himself in the flesh, Emmanuel, are getting up and praying first thing in the morning. And every example is that King David did that, Daniel did that, and the ever the servants of God did do that. Then you can come back and pray, perhaps in the middle of the day, before lunch or after lunch. Remember, Peter was apparently doing that, praying just before lunch, when he had this vision of the various wild animals let down, the pe pe uh, vision of the unclean meats type thing, as they tried to say, and so on. He was praying at noon. And so many men of God and women of God must have learned the habit, building a habit where it's just like breathing out and breathing in. You get the habit of daily exercise. You get the habit of eating certain good foods and avoiding other bad foods. You get the habit of praying to God on your knees before anything can interfere, before anything can stop you. That's a tremendously important habit to help you make a breakthrough with God Almighty in your prayers. So please try to think about that. I'll give you a couple of examples. And Mark, Mark chapter 1, and in verse uh, 33, I'd like to read them all, but I usually, rather than just tend to give you 50 or 75 scriptures, I'll like to explain the ones I do have so you can remember the background. Now at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick, and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Christ was healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease, we read in the Gospels. He had that power. Where did he get that power? Was he God? He was God in a sense, but he was also able to die. He had that power because of being Emmanuel, God with us, and tempted in all points like as we are. He prayed all the time, no doubt in a spirit of prayer all day long. But, the next verse shows the beginning of the day. Now in the morning, verse 35, have, uh, in the morning, having uh, risen a long while before day, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now they had little homes, and some of you have been to Israel and seen them. The homes were not very big. They didn't have a basement or an attic or anything like we have today. And he probably liked to pour out his heart to God and maybe even talked out loud or cried or whatever. So he'd go clear out behind some trees, up, up behind a big rock on the side of the hill somewhere where he would have real privacy and lift up his hands before the Creator and remember all the creation. He had made that creation. God made all things for Jesus Christ. 
And he prayed to his father and said, Father, I'm here and you're there. And I'm now down in this physical flesh and I need your help. And he talked to God perhaps for an hour or so before the daylight or before the day even got underway, maybe starting to pray at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. That's what Jesus did. That was his example to pray first thing in the morning. And that's where he got that power. You turn to chapter 6, Mark chapter 6. And here, you, of course, you find in around verses 38 to 42 how they, he fed 5,000 people. Of course, you know, with the uh, baskets that he had ha had here and all these people were fed and they were full by this miracle. And it said in verse 44, uh, uh, now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. And Matthew says beside women and children. So there may have been 15 to 25,000 people actually that he fed on that occasion from just a few little things because it was a miracle. Doesn't make any difference how number it was. If God can feed 5,000, he could feed 55,000. You know that. But the world doesn't know that. And these men didn't figure that out either, as you'll see. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side across the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Tiberias, they call it various names while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. So here's Jesus praying at the end of the day as well. Now when evening came, here he was praying, when the sun set, of course, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he alone on the land. And then he saw them straining and rowing for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, now, I'm not saying he was praying every one of those hours, but the indication was he was praying a long time. The fourth watch of the night, the commentaries tell us, was between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. So maybe around 4 o'clock in the morning, Jesus came walking on the water. What gave him the power? Well, he was communing with the great God, his Father, with whom he'd been from eternity, had total faith, and just stepped out on this lake he created, you know, a few thousand years ago as he recreated the earth and walked on that lake, that body of water. God created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, verse 9. It didn't seem very awesome to him. I mean, he'd made that bunch of water, so he just walked on it. You think of it from his point of view. He had total faith. We don't. So he walked on the water, and when they saw him, they were afraid, and they were crying out in fear. And he said, be of good cheer, it's me, don't be afraid. And then he went up into the boat to them, verse 51, and the wind ceased. Right when he stepped in the boat, the wind had been, whoa, and all the boop, just like someone turned off a big fan. And their hearts began to pound, and they thought, wow, here's this guy that sleeps next to me in the bedroll at night out under the stars, and we kid around and get in and out of the boat together. But something's different about him, you know. He does these things I don't understand. Here was God in the flesh, and they were unconverted. They didn't have God's spirit. They really didn't get it. They, they realized he, he's, he's different, but they didn't fully understand. And they were just astonished. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. And the commentaries tell you the Greek expressions mean here, they repeat certain words over and over in a sense, greatly amazed beyond measure and marveled. They were really shaken by this because they did not understand why. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. If they had grasped what Jesus was, here was Emmanuel, God in the flesh. He could feed 5,000 or 15 or 5 million people. It didn't make any difference. He could walk on water. He could shoot up to Pluto and back again in a matter of seconds. Just think his thought and be there because he made time and space. Time and space aren't beholden to, I mean, he's not beholden to time and space. Time and space is beholden to Christ. He's the one that created that whole concept. And once we understand that, we understand the power of the great God we're dealing with. He understood that power. And so he did these things, but they were just shaken for they didn't grasp the power that he had shown and didn't learn the lesson they should have learned when he suddenly felt, fed maybe 15 to 25,000 people here with just a few loaves and fishes. They had not understood that. So they thought, well, he can do this over here. Oh, this over here, this is too hard. God can heal my flu. 
But man, if my child or my friend gets, uh, you know, gets AIDS, or my child or my friend gets the avian flu, then we're really scared. That's impossible to heal. Oh, really? That's ridiculous. God could heal anything. It doesn't make any difference to the God we serve. And as these things start happening, we've got to really realize that, brethren, and build faith and project that faith into our prayers as well. So faith and prayer go so much together. And these examples could be used for faith as well as prayer. But we have to realize he, of course, when he had sent them away, he departed to a mountain to pray. So he prayed for several hours, probably that long evening, and he was absolutely close to God, and then he walked on the water. Many of the times you read Jesus having a long prayer just before he does some tremendous thing, and that source of power was from his contact with God, and much of that contact was generated, of course, through prayer, as we see. You turn back to Psalm 55, if you would, very basic scripture that we've used many times, but I want to review it at least. Here, brethren, again, is a basic example. It's not some offbeat something. It's the man after God's own heart, the one God uses as a type of, of Christ. David was the type of Christ, the great king over Israel, as Christ will be king of kings. And Psalm, Psalm 55, uh, he says in verse 16, As for me, I will call upon the God, and the Eternal shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud. And sometimes, as some of my Jewish friends and Hebrew teachers and ambassadors have said, when it uses these expressions, it means that. Some of these men, when they prayed, may have been outside, they weren't trying to show off to other men, would cry aloud. Oh, my God, help me. And they would really cry out loud and not be ashamed, put their whole being in their prayer. Evening, morning, and at noon. What does that tell you? Three times a day. So in the morning, David would pray, no doubt pray somewhere at noon, around 3 o'clock, the time of the evening sacrifice, and maybe again before he went to bed at night. Evening, morning, and at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. If we learn to do that again, brethren, as a habit, as a habit, then we're walking with God. I find if I just pray once a day, and that's not bad, many days I do that, but I try to pray three times a day, and I've gotten into the habit mainly of praying two times a day at least, virtually always. Sometimes I mess up. I'm not perfect in anything, certainly not that either. But the more you pray, the more often you pray, even on your knees, then you're, it's not like you have to get acquainted with God all over again. Do you follow me? You know, if you just pray once a day and then all these things happen and the next morning you're back and you've been, you know, you've gone here and there and watched TV and all kinds of other things and got in an argument with your wife and had to kick the cat out of the house. We don't have a cat. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But whatever else may happen, your mind's on all this stuff. You know, maybe you watch the news on TV or some other rotten program that you maybe shouldn't have watched or something and your mind's on all that stuff. As Dr. Scott Winnell says, your mind gets on that. That takes your time. And then you go to bed, and the whole next morning, it's been 24 hours since you prayed to God on your knees. So you kind of have to work into it again, you see, as you pray. You know, if you're praying two or three times a day, it helps that vital, close feeling of close contact with your Father in heaven. That's very, very important, and you want to understand that. Turn now to Daniel chapter 6. Again, we've used this, of course, many times. Daniel 6, verse 10. Here again was one of the greatest prophets in human history. Why was God using him so much? He knew this writing had been signed that no one was to pray to anything else except the king. He took his life in his hands to do otherwise. How dare him? He knew, brethren... If he did not keep that contact with God, those men, if you read the whole story, were trying to get him. They were trying to trap him. They would trap him some other way. His contact with God had to be close, regardless. And so when the writing was signed, he went anyway to his home. And apparently, you know, in his evening or at noon, 
and in his upper room with his windows toward Jerusalem. That tells us something. He spread the windows open. He's in an upper second story where people couldn't see him. He throws open these big windows, and he looks out at the creation toward Jerusalem to see where the temple had been and hopefully would be again. That's what he did. That was his way of life. He prayed toward Jerusalem, no doubt with his hands up. And he knelt down on his knees, not one knee, both knees to God, knees, three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. This was unusual? No. As his custom was since early days. Here's this great man of God. This was his way of life to pray on both knees three times a day. And probably most of the time looking out that window with his eyes up into the sky looking at God's great creation and talking to God with whole, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, as it tells us in the New Testament. Three times a day, renewing that contact with the Creator. That's where his strength was. That's why he could be delivered in the lion's den. That's why he could be delivered all these other times. That's why he had such tremendous wisdom and, and favor in the sight of the great one of the greatest emperors of all human history, because the Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian empires reckoned as the kingdom of gold, you know, and all the other empires were inferior. Now, God looking down from heaven even knew as far as the human empire, they had a lot going for them. They really did. A tremendous wealth and beauty and unity and that kind of thing. And Daniel was put literally running that empire for a while, right under the king. Why? Because God granted him that wisdom. God granted him that favor. He walked with the God of Israel. He walked with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He walked with God. He prayed on his knees three times a day. You turn back to Luke in your New Testament. Luke chapter 18, if you would. Luke chapter 18, brethren. And here is again a, a, a scripture that are, hopefully is familiar. Verse 1 Jesus spoke a parable that men might always pray and not lose heart. Always pray. Don't give up and quit. Saying there was in a certain city a judge who didn't fear God and regard man. And, and this widow comes asking for deliverance. And he says, well, though I don't fear God or regard man, but I'll, I'll help this widow. She kept coming. She's going to wear me out. This old lady won't give up and quit, you see. By her continual coming, she'll weary me. So he was a carnal man, but he at least he wasn't vicious. He thought, well, I better listen to her. She's going to wear me out. So he decided to answer her. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge says. In other words, if this carnal judge can do this, how much more will God hear our prayers if we keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and keep coming and never give up? And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him when? Once a day, once a week, who cry out to him night and day, all the time, night and day, though he bears long with them. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. That is when the time comes. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Quite a rhetorical question Jesus asked here at the end. Will he really find faith on the earth, indicating there's going to be very little of that kind of faith today? Here we are, this tiny little group, 100 and 106 of us in this, in this room, and here are these great big churches all over this city with maybe five or 10,000 members, and all over this nation they have these great big churches, and then all the other people in the Roman Catholic Church, over one billion of them, and over one billion Muslims who believe in a different God, a whole different way of life, and we're like nothing. As I've said, we're half a peanut shell in the Pacific Ocean. How can we hold up our head? Because we worship the God who looks down on them as so many little ants, a little dark ball out in space, and when he gets ready to shake this earth, these little ants are going to be terrified, absolutely terrified. But you and I should not be terrified if we know that God and walk with that God and talk with that God and commune with that God regularly as our Father and have Him living His life in us through Jesus Christ. We'll have faith and we'll have this relationship with God and with Christ. So we want to understand that and never give up and quit as we pray. Keep on praying regularly 
And when God does not answer right away, keep on praying and ask God if it's something wrong and you sense it's wrong, something you're asking is bad, don't ask, quit asking. But if it's within God's will and you sense it's probably all right, keep on asking. Maybe it's better to wait. The first time some of my children asked me for a bicycle, I didn't get them to give them a bicycle the next day. I may have said, well, we'll wait till you're a year or two older. You'll have a little bit more maturity. And they might have wanted to drive the car the minute I got a car. And they said, well, you know, let's wait. And you can, you, till you get a little older, have a little more experience. God does ask us that way too, because a thousand years is a day with God. And a day is a thousand years. If he has you wait a few years, that's not very long as God counts time. And he's simply waiting until the time is right in many instances. And again, we need to understand that. So the first key is to make prayer a regular habit and persevere. Persevere in prayer. Pray continually. And that's so very, very important. I'll always remember talk with Mr. Armstrong over in Tucson after his massive heart failure and tried to help him with all my heart for that seven months after the terrible state break-in of the receivership. And I was over there and he was telling me and maybe one or two others were there, I don't remember, but at least I was there with one other, maybe no other. But he said, Rod, he said, when I was recuperating from that massive heart failure here in Tucson, and he wasn't ever in Pasadena for two or three years in a row there, he said, I was so weak, he said, I, I could hardly lift my hand up to feed myself, I just completely knocked out. And he said, I prayed to God over and over and over. He said, I prayed 30 to 60 times a day. And I said, Father, please forgive me. I have not done as zealously as I should. He didn't do something bad, but he was examining himself. He said, please give me the chance to put the church back on the track. And he begged God over and over that God would do that. Help him put the church back on the track. And God heard that prayer and brought him back at a very advanced age, and he was allowed to teach the full truth. Some crouched down, one great big tall guy, when I was put over the ministry, uh, he all of a sudden got sick, and he was disappeared. <laughs> I thought it was kind of amusing. He was so big it's hard to disappear, but he tried to disappear. And he was around when he was supposedly sick, and therefore I didn't kick him out or fire him. He'd caused trouble before. And then all of a sudden, when I was kicked out, and then later the liberals came in, suddenly he was up again. As these several of these guys were like that, they were right back again. But for a few years, they held their heads very low because Mr. Armstrong was putting the church back on the track. And the majority of the brethren followed him in doing that, but they did not do it with understanding, with spiritual depth and maturity, because then when the liberals came back again the second time and swept them right away. And that certainly hurt me to realize how weak human beings are. But nevertheless, God heard his prayer and gave him that opportunity, because that was a witness against them that some of them will remember in the next few years as these things start happening. And they're going to remember what he said and what I've said and others have said. And they're going to be scared to death. And they're going to be tossing and turning and say, wow, all these things they said are happening and I better wake up and get with it. And some of them will come with us. Don't think they won't. They will understand where God is working. The second major key is the approach in prayer, the right approach in prayer. I want to use that as a term because persevering and habit, this, this is the way you approach God in certain aspects of prayer. And the basic uh, way to do that, of course, is revealed by God himself in what we call the uh, uh, Lord's Prayer. So let's turn back to the Lord's Prayer, as it's called. God doesn't call it that, but we do. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. Jesus said, In this manner... Therefore, pray. And here's the way to pray. And I could expand the whole sermon just on this, as you know, but I'll try to have certain highlights and emphasize them a little bit more, perhaps, than we aren't normally do. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And brethren, sometimes we mention that and then rush on to the rest of our prayer. Mr. Armstrong was used more in this age more than any other human being. And he often told me, I mean, often, but several times. He said, Rod, I often devote up to one-third of my prayer, one-third, to just praising and honoring God and thanking God. So I asked myself, do I do that? Do you do that? 
I'm trying to learn that. Brethren, start out your prayer by worshiping God and start out your prayer by focusing on God. I think some of us, God seems way off, and so we, our Father in heaven, then we just get to talking. We sort of hope He's there. Somehow He seems way off, and we hope He's out there. He's not very real. But maybe it'll help you if you study the Bible regularly. That's another key to prayer, of course, as you all know. We've said so many times, because the Bible teaches you in the mind of God and how to pray. But then, as you begin to pray to God, Talk to God in detail about who He is and what His program is and what He's doing. Our Father in heaven, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, God of Moses who led Israel out of Egypt. And as you pray that, picture that. God of David the king who fled from Saul and hid in caves for years. Ten years he was fleeing, but you delivered him again and again. And you made him the mightiest king, the greatest king of Israel, and he's going to be there again. Father in heaven, God of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who sent your Son here to die for us. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, at the Father's right hand for giving your life for us. Thank you for giving your body to be broken, that by your stripes we may be healed. Thank you, O oh God, for this beautiful day. Thank you for this beautiful place. Thank you for my family, for the food, the house, everything we have, for every good and every perfect gift. And you begin to talk to God and let that come out then you focus on God and you talk to God. Thank you for beginning to intervene in human affairs, Father, because we know it means your kingdom is that much sooner. Thank you for guiding these events in the Middle East. Thank you for guiding these events in the weather. Thank you for guiding these events all over the world. Even though they're humbling our people, we thank you for that. We know your kingdom is coming soon, and so we praise your name. You're the God who controls the rise and the fall of nations. You're the God who's going to send your son back as King of kings and Lord of lords. Please send Jesus soon to the Mount of Olives, right there where I've been. You can tell God if you've been there. Send Jesus there and set up your kingdom soon. And as you talk to God, commune with God, honor God, worship God, and focus on how great God is and who he is and what he is, then the rest of your prayer means a lot more because you have identified and come close to the one you're talking about and talking with, I should say, as you commune with God and worship God and thank God and thank God for all the blessings you have. Hallowed be your name. Yes, you can do that for 20 or 30 minutes sometimes if you're praying a long time and don't be afraid to do it. That's how you start your prayer. Your kingdom come, please, in Jesus, quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, it says two or three ways at the end of the book of Revelation. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Please take care of our needs, Father. We're physical. We need your help. Intervene. Please give us our food, our clothing. Help all your children to have enough food and clothing and give your people jobs who are in trouble. Watch over them. Please bless your work. We need your help. We need your blessing on this semi-annual letter. We need to grow. Please give us our needs, and personally, and as a group. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And you better spend a long time on that one, brethren, because God tells you again and again and again and again, if you will not forgive others, he will not forgive you. Please understand that. That is an absolutely vital part of prayer. And in your prayer, you'd say, better say regularly every day of your life, Father, forgive me, help me, help me to see, cleanse thou me from secret sins, help me to realize where I've gone wrong, help me to realize where I'm compromising. And if need be, rebuke and chasten me and rebuke and chasten all your children. I don't hate these other people, just help them, wake them up before it's too late. We don't want to have them wake up in the middle of the tribulation. Help them, stir them. Rebuke and chasten every son you love and stir them so they'll wake up and begin to repent and turn back to you again. And so you can talk to God in that way with all your heart and ask him to forgive then your sins and then start listening where you've gone nuts to be or you've been reading too much or you've been gossiping too much or you've been hating too much or you've been doing this and that too much. Ask him to help you. Help me. Help me. Have mercy on me. Clean me up and scrub me out. Ask God to do that every day of your life then you'll be more like God, and he will help you. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And as you pray, recognize Satan is a very real being. 
a very real personality, and he will try to get at you, and he will try to make you bitter, and he will try to turn you aside. He will try to stir you up in any way he can against God, against God's church, against God's ministry. He's active 100% of the time. He's a spirit being. He never gets tired. He doesn't give up. So we need to pray about that every day. Deliver us from the evil one. For, because God has total power for yours. And at the end of your prayer, you open praising God and you close your prayer praising God. This is the approach. For yours is the kingdom. You're sending your government back to this earth. Please help us to get things ready, Father. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. You have total power to do this, and we know that. Please help us believe that and have faith in that. And yours is the glory forever. Amen. That's the approach you have, and you need to think about that. Take that approach. Cry out to God in that way. And an absolutely vital part of prayer, of course, is to simply focus on God and God's greatness and God's power and God's plan and God's mercy as you open your prayer and thank Him for the blessings and through the prayer, be sure you repent and ask God to forgive you and ask God to forgive others and ask God to help you to forgive others because he will not forgive you unless you forgive others. Because it goes right on again in verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Understand that it just won't happen. You cannot be forgiven unless you forgive others. How can our Father in heaven let you into his eternal family where you're hating and you're hating others and you're against them and you want to put them down and you're going to do that throughout all eternity? No, you're not. No, you're not. He's not going to let people in his kingdom with that kind of an attitude. They would make themselves miserable and they would make everyone else miserable throughout all eternity. The most merciful thing to do is to let them go to sleep and stay asleep. And that's what God will do if they will not repent and get over that. They can have every opportunity to repent, every opportunity to get over it. But if they won't, then they will not be there, period. The third key about praying and breaking through to God in your prayers is to pray in depth. A lot of us have surface prayers. We pray very quickly and we just sort of outline the Lord's Prayer and we say a few things like that. Well, then give me this and give me that. In my bedtime prayers, I used to pray and then as I got began to praying on my own, I would sometimes pray the, the uh, Lord's Prayer when I was in high school and God was beginning to sort of stir me a little bit to understand a little bit as I was hearing Mr. Armstrong so then I would say the Lord's Prayer, and then I would say, well, bless Daddy, and bless Mother, and bless Patty, and bless Catherine, and bless Poochie, our dog, <laughs> and, and help me win this next race in the, running the mile, or a couple things like that. And if I had a sent friend who was sick, maybe ask about that. Two or three other things, but then it was all over. I didn't know what else to pray about. I didn't know God. I read the Bible. But like most Protestants, I would read the Bible maybe one chapter once a week or something, and I read the 23rd Psalm and the Lord's Prayer and the Golden Verse, and, you know, that's about it. But brethren, let's not laugh too loud. Some of us in God's church do not really study the Bible, and we do not really understand the Bible. So if some false teacher comes along, he could take some of us away, as he did thousands of us ever since Mr. Armstrong died. And that's really sad. So we should really understand the Bible and study the Bible, and that's another sermon. That will be one of the later sermons, <laughs> but we need that too, of course, and that ties in with prayer. So uh, the next thing is to pray in depth, and to pray in depth, you do need, however, as I was starting to say, to really study the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't just carelessly read, study, because the studying, the Bible, I mean, is the mind of God, and as you break in and feed on Christ, John 6.57, you need to feed on Christ. This is the written word of Christ and God. 
Christ is God. He is the Word in person. This is the Word in print. And as you feed on Christ, you have the mind of Christ. You think like Christ does, and then you can pray like Christ prayed, because you'll have His mind, you see, His thoughts to help you to pray. And you can pray a lot more in depth if you learn to do that. So that's the biggest key of all as far as praying in depth. But give me a couple of scriptures on this aspect of things, and there are so many. But again, I don't want to just give us a list of scriptures, but help you understand the principle. Turn, if you were, to Luke uh, chapter 6, Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. Here it says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to a mountain to pray. He prayed often, and of course he often prayed in the morning, and well, always, and no doubt in the evening as well. But in this case, he prayed in the evening. And he continued all night in prayer to God. Now, I don't think Jesus prayed all night every night. I'm not trying to tell you he did do that. I'm sure he did not. I have prayed parts of nights a few times where I'd pray four to five hours or something when my wife was dying or other special times. I know Mr. Armstrong said he did too, but I've never prayed all night. I didn't seem to have the physical and mental and spiritual energy to do that like I should have. But Jesus did. He prayed all night to God. What could you talk to God about all night? I know some of you are new in the truth and some are not baptized and you say it's harder to pray more than 10 or 15 minutes, you know, or something. But if you have focused on the Bible, if you read all these scriptures, the mind of God, and you think about God's purpose and the things he's working out over in the Middle East and how that's going to affect us, and you think how he's working things out in the Far East and China may yet start something just when we get extra weak and cross the Straits of Taiwan and put us on the spot because we promised to protect, you know, uh, uh, the Taiwanese, but we don't have the power to do so anymore, frankly. And you ask God to understand, think through all those things. And you think through the problems in Africa. Brethren, we in this room and all your brethren around the world, who's going to really help these people in Africa? You read about the horrible things they're going through. And we saw on TV these women and children huddled together in these villages, you know, and, the, and the, these, uh, what do they call them, Jackawanda something, warriors come. I got this thing wrong, but they come on horses and camels, and they beat them up and kill them and rape the women by the hundred, just humiliate them. Human beings made in God's image, being just humiliated, 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 and butchered and, and killed over and over. Who's going to straighten that out? The United Nations? Of course not. You and I are going to have the opportunity to help those people, to serve those people, to love those people, to say this is the way walk you in it. Christ's not going to go racing around in the sky doing all of that in person. He's building a family. He and the Father are building a kingdom. And we're going to help do that and help literally millions and millions of people in Africa and Mexico and Central and South America and Asia and all over the world who are suffering, who are beaten down. And we're going to help millions of kids in the United States and Canada and Britain are all spaced out on drugs. And they don't know which end is up. They're just all messed up in their lives. And they're into drugs and illicit sex and every other rotten thing we can think of. And they need just as much help. They're sick spiritually and mentally. And the others are sometimes sick or being hurt physically. And they all need help, a lot of help. And if we really give ourselves to God and pray about all these things in detail, God can guide us and use us and help us to help these people. But Jesus prayed all night to God. And what was he praying about primarily in this prayer, though? Well, the next verse tells us. And when it was day, he calls his disciples to him, and he from them chose twelve whom he also named apostles. And then he chose first Simon and it names Peter always first, and then the others later on. He named the 12 apostles right after that all-night prayer. You must know, obviously, that most of his prayer during that night was saying, Father, Peter's very zealous. He is masculine. He's hardy. He rushes out to do things, and I really... He should be one of the 12, it looks like, but please show me, because sometimes Peter gets impetuous, and, and he says things he ought not say, and he gets ahead of himself. Please guide me. Father, I love Thomas over here. He's a really nice fellow, but he seems to doubt, and he seems to have trouble with faith. But apparently God guided him to choose Doubting Thomas anyway, <laughs> as we call him Doubting Thomas today. 
And, you know, he chose the others. And he asked God about others that are not listed here, no doubt, and asked God for guidance and wisdom. He probably talked in detail about them, thought through on his knees their characteristics, their strengths, their weaknesses, how they would fit that job, and talked to God hour after hour. And when it was day, he named the men who are going to have their names engraved in the twelve foundations of the holy temple, the new Jerusalem. And their names are going to be famous throughout all eternity. And it was kind of a basic decision when you think about it that way. He wanted to be sure he was not God fully in that sense. He was God in the flesh. So he was surrounded by human beings and human nature. And he needed, even Jesus Christ, needed extra help from God. And extra wisdom from God. And guidance from God. And so he prayed all night. You talk to God in detail. You've heard about, you know, we ought to break our prayers down fine, like in the ancient sacrifices, God told them to break down the incense fine that they would offer to God. And incense is a type of our prayers. And they were to offer this incense, which was made fine. Our prayers are to be broken up into detail, where we talk to God in detail about this situation, that situation. And we talk and think through out loud with God on our knees every aspect of our life. Every aspect that we know about and are concerned with in the work and in our church and in our brethren. And if we begin to do that, there's no problem praying an hour. The hour goes just like that and it's gone. You say, wow, what happened? The hour is gone. And you will not have a huge problem praying 30 or 40 minutes a day and once in a while an hour or more. Not that I pray an hour every day, I should. So I'm not trying to indicate I do, but once in a while, and it just goes by real quick when I do. I have no problem because I'm involved in the work, and I can pray about Mr. Ames' problems and Mr. Bomer's problems and, and uh, Mr. Amon's problems. They're all sitting here in a row of my three victims here. <laughs> the time just goes by real quick. <laughs> and then I pray about my problems, and even more time goes quick. <laughs> I'm just kidding about their problems, but you see what I mean. If you start breaking your prayers down fine and praying about the details of every human being that you're close to and that you know and ask God to help them and guide them and everything else and the details of the work and Christ's kingdom and every aspect of it and the decisions you need to make in your life, the time goes real quick. So you need to think about that. Pray in depth. And that's something we often do not do in our busy society today. Again, as Dr. Scott Winnell was saying, we just rush on to something else. Oh, we got a prayer finished in 17 minutes today. Isn't that wonderful? No, that's not wonderful. And again, I've used this example in the past. Please don't forget it. I'll use it again here. You men, when you were courting your wife, I'm sure that you gave her 17. Okay, 17 minutes is up. See you later, Joanne. Oh, <laughs> Joanne may never have accepted your proposal. Now, if you're going to court a beautiful woman, you'd better take time. But what if you're in love with God and your Savior, Jesus Christ, and you really do love them, all kidding aside? I know a different kind of love, a different kind of relationship, but the most important relationship in the entire universe, as far as you're concerned, it should be. Because your wife could die. Your husband could die. They could turn aside. They can't save you, but God can save you for all eternity. That is your most important relationship. Don't shortchange God and don't shortchange yourself by praying 17 minutes and quitting. Learn to pray longer and think things through slowly and carefully as you talk to the governor of the universe. That's so important, brethren. Turn back to 2 Kings, if you would, 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings chapter 19 at this point. Get a little more of this tea. And here, most of you know the story why the king of Babylon was trying to threaten the Israelites, and, and the king of Assyria was here. And sent his agent, Rab the Rabshakeh, head over the armies to threaten them. And gave here King Hezekiah of Judah a letter from the great king of Assyria. Very impressive to those men. 
not very impressive to God. Here's God sitting up on his throne at the head of the universe, and here are these little ants down here feeling very important about themselves, so God wasn't concerned, but the men were. And Hezekiah received the letter. This is verse uh, 14, and from the hand of the messengers, and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Eternal and spread it before the ever-living one. He literally took this letter from this pagan king saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And all these other gods have said they're going to save their nations and they didn't do it. What makes you think your God's any different? What makes you think your God's any better? And Hezekiah comes before God and prays and said, O eternal God of Israel, the one who dwells between the Caribbean, you are God. Here's the way you start out your prayers. Show who God is as you honor Him and as you focus your mind. It's good for you. You need it more than He does. He doesn't get a big head about it, but He knows you need that to see who you're praying to and to focus your mind. You are God, He tells them. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, and you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O eternal, and hear. Open your eyes, O eternal, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he sent to reproach the living God. Interesting how it words it. It wasn't just to reproach Israel or Judah. It was to reproach their God, the living God. So he kind of puts the burden back on God, which is good. Nothing wrong. Truly eternal, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods, see their so-called gods, into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they've destroyed them. Now, therefore, O eternal, our God... I pray, here he's praying to God in detail, reads this whole letter, probably a lot more than we have here, talks about the whole thing, talks it all over with God, says he's saying this and saying that, oh God, here's his letter, here's what he says, please hear and answer. I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the eternal God, you alone, you are the great God. Brethren, I often pray, and should more, and you should more, please grant your servants as we learn the lessons we need to learn the gifts of healings and the gift of miracles so that before this work is over that men may know that you're a real God and you have true servants on this earth and they will finally really listen to us and intervene powerfully in human affairs and help us to give the warning specifically so that we can do that job and they'll know that you are God and we're your servants and they will listen to us. That's the way Hezekiah prayed, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, the eternal, are God, you alone. And then Isaiah, the son of Amos, Isaiah was alive then, the true prophet of God, and he sent to Hezekiah, God sent him a message, spoke to him. Thus says the eternal God of Israel, that which you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. And of course, you know what happened, how he then, a few nights later, slew, sent an angel out in verse uh, 35. And it came to pass on a certain night, as you read, that the angel of God went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people rose early in the morning, they were dead. 185,000 of his troops. Wow. Then he went home and his own sons killed him and ran off. God took him in a horrible death for defying the God of Israel. We deal and we serve the Lord God of the armies of Israel. And we have to understand that and have faith in that and realize that. And we need to think it through in that way when we pray and talk in detail to God as Hezekiah did. Now the fourth key, the fourth and final key I want to give you this afternoon is to learn to pray with passion. Learn to pray, brethren, with passion. Mr. Armstrong said a number of times, I'm sure Mr. and Mrs. Apartian will remember this, he said, I'm sure more than two or three times, I think I heard him five or six times, I can't be sure, but a number of times, he said, brethren, I think the biggest lack in prayer among God's people today and the greatest fault that they have as far as their prayers are concerned is that they just pray kind of lackadaisically and they don't get stirred up when they pray. They've been taught in the Protestant world just to recite memorized prayers. 
And his favorite scripture on that, by the way, that he often used, which I will give to you, is Hosea. And I didn't bring the Moffat translation. I'll paraphrase it. I don't think I need to bring it because I know what it says. But he's talking here about Ephraim and Manasseh. He's talking about us. He says in verse 11, Ephraim is like a silly dove without sense. This is Hosea 7, verse 11. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. We try to use these other nations as their allies. I'll bring them down. I'll chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. Yes, they will have heard by the time God does this because we will get this message around the world with God's help. And they will have heard. Woe to them, for they've fled from me. Destruction, they've transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they've spoken lies against me. They did not cry out to me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. And that kind of gives you the idea, and yet the Moffat has it in more clear language than other modern translations. Moffat says, not that they wailed or didn't cry out to me with their heart, but they did not put their hearts in their prayers. They just have this rope prayer. I remember working for this farmer in northern Kansas, and every evening, a nice man, he would just bow his head, blah, 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 the same thing every meal. And just he got it over real quick, and then he'd lift up his head, and his wife would jump, oh, that was so good, now we have this food. It was like, okay, that's over. Wow, we're glad that's over. We can smile and be happy. Just blah, 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 the same thing. Repetition, get it over with quick. The Catholics do that. They say so many Hail Marys, and so many this and so many that. That's one thing that got Martin Luther upset and started this Protestant Reformation. I wrote my master's thesis on that. He went down to Rome as a very sincere young monk from Germany, and he saw the Catholic priest passing the wine back and forth and drinking too much wine, and he also saw how they had races and literally laughed to see who could say Mass the fastest. Who could say it the fastest? <laughs> Let's get it over with. No, that's not talking to the God of creation. They didn't know God. It was just a ritual, just repeating words. That's all they knew. Our people as a whole do not put their hearts in their prayers here in the United States because they don't know God. God's not very real to them at all. And many of us in the church have grown up in this world, and so we repeat just so many words and try to get it over with. We've got to learn to put our hearts in our prayers and to pray with our whole heart and to pray with passion. That's what God wants us to do. You know, David was the man after God's own heart. And one of the best ways to learn to pray, beside all the other things I've given you, and part of reading the Bible a lot, in prayer is to concentrate on the Psalms, the book of Psalms. The Psalms are mainly David's prayers to God and how he prayed to God, the man after God's own heart. And if you read the story of David's life, you can see that David was a man of passion. And I'm not talking about sexual passion. Yes, he had that one great fault, but you know what I mean by passion? Someone that gets really emotionally involved, excited about things. And when he brought up the ark to Jerusalem, he leaped and danced and twirled and so forth, just rejoicing before God, the great God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the Creator. And he was leaping and dancing and praising God. And his wife even tried to put him down because of it. But he was doing it to worship God. And so he put her away, in a sense, partially, Michael, Saul's daughter, because of that horrible disrespect. But at any rate, he had great passion for God. And God honored that. Back in Psalm 86, turn to Psalms if you would now. Psalm 86 at this point. And uh, here... Uh, just one example, there's so many, I could just read you half the psalms, but just to give you a little flavor. Psalm 86, verse 1. Hear me, for I am a poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am holy. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Eternal, for I cry out to you all day long. I cry out. Please, Father, hear me, great God. I cry out to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O eternal, I lift my soul. You see an emotional aspect, passion here. For you, eternal, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. And he goes on. Another example, again, there are scores of them, and I didn't really try to look for every one, so it didn't take too much time. But one I've always loved, a more positive type of crying out, is in Psalm 104. The 104th Psalm, Psalm 104, 
if I may find this without too much trouble. I ran out of markers here, so I have to turn to some of these slowly, which some of these other guys do. I usually have markers and turn real quick, and reveal my secrets to you. <laughs> but Psalm 104, and here is David's prayer about how God takes care of all creation. And in verse uh, 19, he appointed the moon and the seasons. The sun goes its, knows it's going down. You make darkness, and it is night, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. He talks about the whole creation. You, God, our Father, you're in charge of all these wonderful things. And he says then, in verse 31, May the glory of the eternal endure forever. May the eternal rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth, and it trembles. The great God when he began to give the Ten Commandments, he shook the earth at that time. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. While I have life and breath, I'm going to cry out to God, worship God, adore God. You can almost hear the emotion in David's voice when you read these words. I will praise God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him, and I will be glad in the eternal. May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked be no more. Bless the eternal, O my soul. Hallelujah. So this was David's approach in prayer. Emotion, passion, wholeheartedness, worshiping God, crying out to God with tremendous feeling, tremendous feeling. And yet David was a type of Jesus Christ and a man after God's own heart. That's the kind of prayers you always don't have all those emotions. I know that. Some of you are more Anglo-Saxon and kind of stiff upper lip and don't show any emotion. But as we learn to loosen up in the right way, not the wrong way, we can have passion as we worship God. And we can certainly put our whole hearts in our prayers and be uninhibited because God knows our thoughts. And he's not embarrassed when we pour out our whole being to him as we pray to him. Back in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, we read here about the greatest example in all human history. Because this human was God in the flesh. Hebrews, chapter 5. <clears throat> and beginning in verse uh, 4, he talking about the priesthood. No man takes this honor to himself, but he was called by God just as Aaron was. Men must never try to press themselves or push themselves into the ministry. God condemns that. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, talking about Christ, you see, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh... Here is Christ, Emmanuel, God with us when he was here on this earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, meaning continual heartfelt prayers, with vehement cries and tears. The King James says strong crying and tears. Now some of you would be embarrassed if you'd been there. Maybe I would too, not that I'm better, if I weren't used to it and hadn't focused on this. If you saw Christ a young Jew, he wasn't an old man, he wasn't even as old as Dr. Winnale or Dr. Scott Winnale, I mean, or, or uh, Mr. Rod McNair, These young, he was about two or three years younger than they are. And here this young Jewish man was shaking and crying, no doubt his whole body just shaking and tears streaming down his face as he prayed to God with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Father, I'm in this human flesh. I'm tempted just like anyone else now, and you're still up there, and I know you, and I've known you from eternity, but I'm surrounded by this, and Satan's after me. Please help me. And he cried out to God with tears streaming down his face to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, the trials and tests he had to go through, and the human flesh. He cried out to God with his being, with strong crying and tears, emotion, passion. 
I'll always remember uh, being in Pasadena at Ambassador College, and we had a, uh, I forget the name of the contest, Mr. and Mrs. Ames may remember, the Golden uh, Series or Gold Series or some kind of series where they had young musicians and they would have them uh, perform there that would be sort of semi-professional. And one of our musicians entered this contest and Albert Goldberg was the very brilliant uh, music critic for the Los Angeles Times, one of the greatest newspapers on earth. He would evaluate the Los Angeles Symphony and the Hollywood Symphony and all kinds of stuff. And he was there for that occasion. And I had told others about this fellow because I liked him a lot and enjoyed him and enjoyed his singing. But one of the other fellows and I agreed that there was something missing. And I said, uh, I forget how I put it, but he's, he just doesn't seem to to just, just uh, I forget the word I used, to go all out or something about it. And Albert Goldberg, when he evaluated this fellow, he said the same thing I'd been thinking, but didn't know how to express it. In the music review the next day in the Los Angeles Times, he said this person has a lot of musical ability and training and the equipment, but he says he lacks passion. That's the one word he used. And I thought, wow, that was the missing word. I didn't think of that. He lacks passion. If you hear Mario Lanza sometimes, or you hear, as when he was younger, Pavarotti or Placido Domingo or some of those in their very best performances, they will have passion. Passion. The only baptizing, the only movie I ever saw on a baptizing tour, and six or seven baptizing tours all over the United States and England and one down in South Africa, was the one I took with Mr. Ted Armstrong. And uh, he and I were very dear friends at the time and for a number of years after that. And he didn't do bad in this, I'm not saying that at all. But he was very much into music, had a beautiful voice, was a good singer. And he really kind of conned me into seeing one movie on this tour. We were gone three and a half weeks. He said, let's see The Student Prince. So we saw The Student Prince together. And I forget the name of the actor who plays the the prince who's to take over the, the throne of this German uh, principality, whatever it was, you know, and uh, when the king was to die. And so finally the king died, and the young prince came back from this college where he'd been dating and dancing with this beautiful peasant girl whom he sorrowfully had to give up because that was their way then. You, you married your peers and so on, yet he loved her. You know how the movie, the Hollywood eyes, that part, I'm sure. It was, a, it was just a fake movie anyway, but it was based on, I guess, something that had happened. But he was, here was the, the young actor, and here was the king lying, his, his casket in this great, beautiful cathedral. And the, then he began to sing, and of course it was Mario Lanza. <laughs> Mario Lanza was singing, and he was lip-syncing. And Mario Lanza's voice was singing, I'll walk with God. And that really hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. And ever since then, I Walk With God has been, been one of my favorite songs, and I've had people sing it through knowing that in my honor and, and God's honor, I hope. I Walk With God. And Mario Lanza was one of my favorite singers and the sing favorite of many millions of people because he sang with passion. He didn't just sing the notes. His voice would just swell out, and you could hear, you know, the vibrato, and you could hear his, his passion, his whole being was singing this song, I'll Walk With God, and so many other songs he sang. Brethren, we need to have that in our prayers to God, that passion, that powerful feeling, my God, my King, my Father, my Rock, my Redeemer, the one who gives me every good and every perfect gift. I worship you, I adore you, I give my life to you, and you pour that out to God and learn to do it with feeling and learn to do it with meaning. And God honors that. And so that is the thing Christ had as he prayed. He prayed with passion. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And here's one of the most famous examples, of course, of all of this. Again, God in the flesh. At the very end of his life, just before he was crucified. This is Luke chapter 22, beginning verse 39. And coming out, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said, Pray that you do not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed. 
saying, Father, if it is your will, remove this cup from me. Please don't take, make me take this hemlock, in a sense, using a figurative expression. They used to poison their political enemies, made them drink poison. Help me get around this. If there's any way, rather than going through this horrible death, nevertheless, not my will, but may yours be done. Then an angel, God literally sent an angel there from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, Jesus was human. Jesus had been up and down the streets and up and down the roads of Palestine. You know he had. He walked all over everywhere. And the histories tell us that there were often men crucified. He was not the only one crucified. Most of you know that. That was a common form of, 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 of capital punishment for anyone who was despised criminal. And they were hanging there writhing in agony sometimes three to six days before they'd finally die. And he'd heard their shrieks and moans as they were dying, hanging on a cross. He knew what was ahead of him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And I've read this in books and in commentaries that there is a situation the doctors have found up, I know they gave one example up in Alaska where men were in extreme terror, I guess fleeing from some grizzly bears or something, and they were scared and inside these uh, heavy uh, clothing, but because of the uh, strenuousness and all of their passion and their fear, blood was mingled and their, somehow their capillaries burst or whatever it is, and blood got into their sweat glands. And they literally sweat blood. They sweat blood. That's where that expression comes from, what Jesus Christ did. He sweat blood because he was so earnest to do the right thing, to be willing to die, not just to die, but he knew he had to die in a right attitude. Think about it. He could say, I'm going to get you later. He didn't say that. He didn't think that. He had to die, he had to be tortured, spit upon, beaten, kicked, and cursed, and at the same time say and think, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, these, these Roman soldiers here, they're just told to do this. They don't know me. They're not mad at me personally. They just don't get it. Have mercy on them, and have mercy on these Jews who stirred them up. They don't get it either. And so Jesus had to die in a perfect attitude. And he cried out to God with the depths of his being and prayed more earnestly. And sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer and had come to the disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. They were so overcome. Have you ever done that as a little child? Sometimes my father would spank me and I would just go and lie down to escape the whole thing and go to sleep. <laughs> you kind of you use sleep as a form of escape sometimes and that's what they were doing. And he said, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. So I tell of all of you and you brethren around the world, rise and pray. As we come toward the end of this age and events speed up all around this world, we would better rise and pray. And we better pray with all of our heart. And we better make this kind of breakthrough prayers with our being that God will hear our prayers and move us forward. Mr. Armstrong said the church of God moves forward on its knees. We need to do that, brethren. We need to grow. We need to have more of the gifts of God's spirit. We need God's blessing on this semi-annual letter. We need more ministers and dedicated leaders, men and women. And Mr. Winnale and Dr. Winnale have put together a wonderful program here about training leaders and later training ministers. We pray God will bless that, bring many along, and help us have the impact on this world. Not a lot of people believe what we believe at all. And all the branches of what we call the Church of God together, just a, you know, half a peanut shell, we know that. All together, we're just tiny. We need God's help. We need God's mercy. We need God's spirit. And we get that spirit, we get that faith, we get that power by feeding on Christ and studying this book where it be, God becomes more real and by getting down on both knees and saying, Our Father in heaven and glorifying God, talking to God, describing the God we're talking to as we begin our prayers and getting really acquainted with God by praying with all of our hearts.